All right, welcome to JM Lectures. We are moving on to the fourth unit of grade 11 physics, dynamics. Dynamics is all about forces and the effect that forces have on the particles they are applied on, right? So we have the question here, question number six says, two students, A and B, with masses MA and MB respectively, stand on wheeled trolleys as shown in the figure below. If student A has a larger mass and pushes student B, then what can be said about their acceleration? So this comes along with a figure showing two students on trolleys. I guess by trolleys, they mean skateboards. So two students are standing on skateboards and one has a larger mass than the other. So let's write down what we are given, right? So I know there's no numbers here, but it still helps because we have some values here that are given, right? The first value that we have is that they have masses. There's mass of A and mass of B. So we have the mass of student A and we have the mass of student B. And specifically, we know that the mass of student A is larger than the mass of student B. And secondly, we also have something about the forces. We know that student A pushes student B, all right? And our question is what we're required to find is, what is the relationship of their accelerations, right? So what is the relationship between acceleration A and, oh, I'm sorry, I should make this capital, acceleration A and acceleration B? What is the relationship? Are they equal? Are they opposite? What is that relationship? That's what we're looking for here, okay? So to answer this question, we're gonna have to look at Newton's laws, okay? There's three laws of Newton. We're gonna look at the second and the third law. So the second law has something to do with force being applied on a body. And putting it simply, whenever a force is applied on a certain mass, it accelerates, right? So this is the formula you, you use it to, or in order to understand Newton's second law of motion, right? And this is important here, you see, because we see we have force, we have mass and acceleration. So we're gonna have to use this formula in order to understand this question. And the third law of motion, the third law of Newton states that any force applied on an object has an equal and opposite force, right? So whenever you apply a force on something, there's always an equal and opposite force or a force with the same magnitude, but in the opposite direction, all right? So let's start with this third law right here, okay? So we know that student A pushes student B, right? But we have to conclude that Newton's third law of motion is true, right? We have to apply Newton's third law of motion. So if student A pushes student B, we can then assume that student B pushes student A back with an equal and opposite force. That is the third law of Newton, all right? I probably should put a vector sign above all of this because these are vectors, right? Because it's direction that matters. When I say minus, I mean the vector is in the opposite direction, right? So we, it, the question only states that force A or student A applies a force, but we can conclude that student B would apply an equal and opposite force. So that's when we use the third law. Where would we use the second law? Well, let us look at the accelerations and the forces and the masses of the two boys separately, all right? Let's look at the acceleration of the two boys separately. Let us start with the first student, student A, right? Student A applies a force which makes the mass accelerate, okay? And similarly, student B also applies a force that makes the mass of the boy accelerate, right? So this is how we're using the second law, right? That's how we're using this second law of motion, that force is equal to mass times acceleration, right? That's how we're using this law. So since we're being asked about acceleration, let's rearrange these formulas so we have acceleration in terms of force and mass, right? So we have here acceleration A is in fact equal to force A divided by mass A, right? And just the same as that, acceleration B is equal to force B divided by mass B, right? So I'm just rearranging them so we're looking at these two in terms of acceleration, okay? So we have to find some way to relate these two because we're asked about the relationship between the two. Why not rearrange the quantities we have here in terms of A and make them in terms of B? And in that case, we'll be able to find the relationship between the two. All I mean by that is, we know that force A is in fact equal to the negative of force B. So let's rewrite the formula in that sense, okay? The acceleration of A is equal to force A, which is actually the negative of force B, right? And what about the mass of A? Well, you say the mass of A is greater than the mass of B, right? So let's just, for the sake of example, let's say that the mass of A is 
twice as large as the mass of B, okay? It's twice as large, okay? So let's do that same thing here. The mass of A is equal to twice the mass of B, just for the sake of example, right? So what do we have here? If you look at this, if you isolate this part right here, right? Force B over mass B, that's exactly acceleration B. It's the exact same thing, which means we can replace this with acceleration B. You'll understand why I'm doing this in a bit, but when you write this again, you get that acceleration A is equal to negative one over two times, I just isolated this negative one over two from right here, times acceleration B, okay? And this is key right here. We have everything we need here to define the relationship between the two, right? Everything we need here. We can rearrange this if we want to. We can rearrange this to something to look more like um, twice of acceleration A is equal to the, or negative two times acceleration A is equal to acceleration B. There's a lot of different ways to write it, but all of them represent the same thing. Okay, so this is another way to write it, right? So what can we conclude from this, okay? I found the relationship between A and B, the acceleration of the two. What we can conclude from this, all right, what, we, what we can conclude from this is that, first of all, acceleration A and acceleration B are in opposite directions. How do I know that? There's a negative sign right here. Just as I represented force A and force B in being in opposite directions by putting a negative sign right here, Acceleration A and acceleration B are in opposite directions. But what does this half represent? Or what does this two represent? Well, I put the value of two here. I said that mass A is equal to twice of mass B. But all that means is acceleration A is equal to half of acceleration B. Or if I put four, it would be one fourth of acceleration B. Or I put that value, right? But whatever this number is, it would make acceleration A less than acceleration B, right? Because if acceleration B was like four, then be four over divided by two, this would be two, right? Or all I'm trying to say is that whatever value of acceleration A we put, it's going to be less than acceleration B. Or you can put it here, acceleration B is equal to twice the acceleration of A, right? So acceleration B is definitely greater. Or we can say that acceleration A is less than acceleration B. So two things that we found here. We found first that acceleration A and acceleration B are in opposite directions because of this negative sign here. And also we found that acceleration A is less than acceleration B. So if we were to look at our choices, see this is all theoretical, right? This is all theoretical calculations, but you can use formulas in order to prove a theory. So we look at our choices, we look for something that says acceleration A is less than acceleration B, and that would be our first choice here, right? It doesn't mention about the direction, but look at choice C. It says both boys will be accelerated by the same magnitude, but in opposite directions. See, that question could have tricked you. It's not their accelerations that are equal and opposite, but their forces that are equal and opposite, okay? The accelerations, they are opposite, right? They are opposite because of this negative sign, but they are not equal. Acceleration A is in fact less than acceleration B, which would be our first choice. And that is it. All right, moving on to the seventh question. The question says, an open trolley is rolling on a level surface without frictional loss through a vertical downpour of rain, as shown in the figure below. So that's the figure we have right here. And it asks, as the trolley rolls on appreciative amount, an appreciative amount of rainwater, sorry, accumulates in the cart, what will be the speed of the cart? Okay, so this question is about the change in velocity over a certain time as the mass of the trolley changes. Okay, it doesn't seem like that at first, but I'll explain it once I draw the picture. So give me a second to draw this picture here. Okay, so I drew these true trolleys, they're the same trolleys, but it's over a certain period of time. So this is the initial trolley, and then this is the final trolley, or how it changes through time. So we see here that it's moving with a certain speed, right? It has an initial speed, but it's empty, all right? Or maybe there's a little bit of water, that doesn't really matter. Let's say there's a little bit of water here because it's raining constantly, right? So the rain is falling down, and as time goes by, it starts to fill up. It's an open trolley, it's open at the top, so the rain starts to fill up the trolley. And the question is, how does this affect the speed, okay? So, you can think about this theoretically, right? You can just think, well, if it had little water at first, right, it probably moved easily. But then if it started to increase in water, then maybe it started to move 
slower, right? Because there's more water to carry, making it move a little bit slower because nothing's pushing it. It's going on a certain speed, right? So that would be a theoretical approach to it. But the physics approach to it, we would have to use a concept known as the law of conservation. The law of conservation of momentum. Okay, so the formula for momentum uh, is P is equal to mass times velocity, right? So it directly relates the mass and the velocity, okay? So how we can apply this to this formula is we can look at the momentum initially and the momentum finally. The main point about the law of conservation of momentum is that it should be equal or the initial velocity, the velocity, I mean, sorry, or it should be equal, or the initial momentum should be equal to the final momentum. And all we mean by that is, let's say that the trolley has a certain mass initially, and we multiply it by the mass, or by the velocity, and then we have a final mass, and then we have a final mass, and we multiply it by the final velocity, right? So this is the conservation of momentum. The momentum we have right here should be equal to the momentum we have right here, okay? So our question is, how does the velocity change, okay? Well, what we can do is we can divide this by mass two and divide this by mass two. And why I'm doing that is I wanna rearrange the formula so we can see the relationship between the velocity one and the velocity two, okay? So velocity two is equal to velocity one times this ratio we have here. So what is mass one over mass two? So mass one would be the mass we have right here, right? And mass two would be the mass we have right here. So you can clearly see that the mass of two is greater than the mass of one because as time went by, more and more water accumulated in the trolley, okay? So if mass two is greater than mass one, right? If mass two is greater than that mass one, that would make this number less than one, right? Or I could say, for example, if this was two and this was one, it could be one over two v1 is equal to v2, okay? I just put random numbers. This is what I usually do because it's sometimes hard to theoretically comprehend this. I usually put numbers in place of values that I don't know so I can imagine it clearly. Like I know mass two is greater than mass one. So why not give them the values of two and one so I can clearly see the relationship? So after I do that, I can clearly see that velocity two would be equal to half of velocity one, right? I put the number half. I could have put one third or one fourth. So this isn't really specific. This is like a theoretical assumption. I could say generally though that velocity two would be less than velocity one, right? That would be my final conclusion. Whatever value I put for M2 and N1, as long as M2, as long as M2 is greater than M1, right? Why is it greater? Because through time, water accumulates in the trolley, making it have a greater mass. So as long as mass two is greater than M1, V2 will always be less than V1. So what would happen to the speed? The speed would decrease due to the law of conservation of momentum. And if we look at our choices, we see that that is exactly choice B that we have right here. The speed decreases because of the conservation of momentum. And this is how you would prove it. And that's it.